Hey everyone, Mike Hutton here with One Christian Thinks. Today I want to carry on my series discussing freedom. If you can remember way back to, I don't know, December sometime I think, I recorded a couple episodes starting a discussion on freedom. The first episode was talking about freedom and the law of God. And I discussed how the law of God is built into God's created order. And because of that, we realize freedom to its fullest by obeying the law of God. The flip side of that is also true. If we depart from the law of God, if we ignore God's will, then we are also going to descend into slavery and tyranny in this world in a very real sense. The second episode on freedom, I sought to answer the question, should Christians be worried about freedom in this world? And I said, yes, Christians absolutely should be worried about freedom in this world because when we don't have freedom, that is also when people are the most victimized. So by, by pursuing freedom, by supporting the push for freedom in this world, we help to decrease victimization of other people. But I just want to stress that one point again, that freedom is found in obeying God's law and obeying God's will in, in following God's will for our lives. That's an entirely different definition of freedom than how we think of freedom today. Freedom today is generally thought of as doing whatever you want. Perhaps, perhaps you are still obeying the law of the land, but you're still doing whatever you want, disregarding God's law, disregarding other people, um, disregarding consequences that might come later. That is generally thought of, thought of as freedom, doing whatever you want. But my definition of freedom, it's not my definition. It's a, it's a much, much older definition. Um, the definition that I presented in my first episode was freedom is found in following God's law and following God's will for your life. So when, when people attempt to, to obey God in their lives and when the government also attempts to obey God, that is when society will be the most free. And when people reject God's will and when the government rejects God's will, that very quickly leads to tyranny. So I just wanted to stress that point because it leads very much into what we will be discussing today. Um, I've got a few notes here. I'm going to be referring to notes. So you might hear flipping pages and, and uh, I've got a Bible with me, so I might have to reference a few things. Hopefully that's not too distracting, but I want to specifically discuss, like I said, freedom and personal responsibility. So, um, perhaps you might, you might think that that personal, personal responsibility is kind of the, the downfall of freedom. If you're free to make your own choices, well, you have to accept the responsibility of what those choices bring. And, and sometimes if you're making bad choices, then you're going to have to deal with the consequences. And, and that's where personal responsibility comes in. Now, <laughs> freedom, um, freedom demands personal responsibility. You cannot have freedom without personal responsibility. If you're free to make choices, you're also entirely responsible for the outcome of those choices. <clears throat> In society today, we often see that people want to make their own choices. They want to do their own thing, but very frequently, they don't want to deal with the consequences of their choices. They want someone else to deal with the consequences of their choices. So just a couple quick examples. Um, we see that with the sexual revolution. The sexual revolution basically made, uh, basically removed the stigma of premarital sex and said, said it's permissible to have sex whenever you want with whoever you want. But then they also attempted to decrease the responsibility of that by, by fighting for free abortions. So, um, 
part of the part of the natural consequences of sex is the possibility of pregnancy and with the sexual revolution yes they wanted that they wanted to make that choice to be promiscuous to um have sex whenever and with whoever they wanted but they didn't want to deal with the consequences possible pregnancies they wanted to remove those consequences as well so um that's where the 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 increase of abortion came from um there was another i had another example another decent example oh th my example was uh was free college tuition so people want the freedom to be able to study which is great it's great to pursue education but they didn't want to deal with the responsibility of funding their education they wanted someone else to pick up the tab and it's a it's a very there's a very strong push for that free education um and i'm gonna get i'm gonna talk more about this in another episode um the claim that we have a right to education what what people are saying is they want the freedom to to study what they want they want the freedom to pursue what they want but they don't want to have to pay for it they want someone else to have to deal with the consequences if they go into debt well the government will pay the debt off the government can only pay it off by taking money from others but they don't want that consequence so society is full of examples where people want to be able to make their own decisions good decisions or bad decisions without dealing with the consequences but freedom and personal responsibility are absolutely um, inherently connected um, now the, there's another truth that we are seeing in society as well people are very willing to give up freedom if it also means that they don't have to take responsibility for something so with regards to the the COVID interventions society was very willing very willing to be locked down um to many 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 people were very willing to um not go to work as long as they did not have to deal with the consequences as long as they did not have to accept personal responsibility for um the transmission of COVID and and you saw that through um government programs government assistance programs that that paid people who weren't working to stay at home the government actually pays people to to stay at home i think we all are very familiar with that reality and so like i said what we're seeing is the decrease of freedom so that people don't have to accept responsibility that's another thing that we're seeing now what does the bible say about freedom and personal responsibility i want to <clears throat> go back to genesis 1 to 3 to to look into this i think there's a lot that we can get from those passages so discussing the biblical the biblical view of freedom and, and personal responsibility um i've went over some of this in my first episode on freedom in creation god gave man ultimate freedom man was um man was living in creation god had um god's law was present in creation as part of the created order because god's creation reflected him and therefore reflected his law so man was man was living in perfect freedom in accordance with god's law in in accordance with god's will perfect freedom but man also had essentially ultimate responsibility god put the tree of the knowledge of of good and evil in the garden and forbid man forbade man from eating from it um and what basically what we can see in that is that man was given ultimate responsibility god gave man ultimate responsibility if if adam and eve ate from the the tree of the knowledge of good and evil if they ate that fruit god said they would well i'll, I'll grab my bible here to to read it um i just have to find the passage so bear with me here 
Genesis 2, verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So man was given, essentially, complete responsibility. He could not eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Or he would die. Death wasn't present in the Garden of Eden. He was fully responsible. He was fully responsible for maintaining his relationship with God, for preventing death from entering the world. God gave man that full responsibility. So we see that God gave man complete freedom, a perfect relationship with God, um, the ability to to follow God's will in its fullness. But God also gave man absolute responsibility. The responsibility to, to not have death enter the world. The responsibility to maintain his relationship with God. All of that. Now, why would God give man this responsibility? Why would God give man the ability to essentially destroy God's perfect creation? To allow sin to enter the creation? Why would God give man that, that freedom? Wouldn't God, after creating a perfect world, wouldn't God want to keep it perfect? Well, the reason for that is, is that God wanted a relationship with man. God wanted, God wanted love. God wanted love to be present in his creation. With it, if, if God decided to not give man free will then God also could not have a relationship with man. You can't, you can't have a relationship with a robot. A robot can't love. And if God didn't give man free will, he would have essentially created a robot. Man, as the, the pinnacle of God's creation, was given free will in a way that none of the rest of creation had. Of course, with that freedom... With that responsibility came the risk of, of essentially of destruction, destroying God's creation. But God saw that risk and God, God thought that risk was, was worth it. Worth it to have a relationship with his creation. Worth it to have a relationship with, with the people that he had created in his image. So it's pretty important to remember that that the risk of giving people responsibility is worth it, even though they might ruin it. God thought it was worth it when he gave man the, the freedom and, and also the ability to essentially destroy his creation. So that's something that we should reflect on too. Carrying on then, man fell into sin. Man disobeyed God and therefore brought sin into God's perfect created order. And what do we see after the fall? What do we see after man fell into sin? I'm going to read Genesis uh, 3 verse 8, starting at 3 verse 8 here. So um, this is after the fall into sin. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, that's God, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree and I ate. So what do we see here? We see God essentially examining man. It's, it's almost like a court of law. God is the prosecutor. Man is the defendant. God is giving man a chance to defend himself. Giving man a chance to explain his actions. What's 
what's notable about this or why this is worth noting is because you don't give someone a chance to explain themselves if they don't have personal responsibility. If, for example, a pet dog chews on your shoes, you don't try to get the dog to explain their actions. Sure, dogs can't talk. Poor example. But you get what I'm saying. Because, just just because God actually gave man the, the chance to explain himself means that man also had personal responsibility. If you don't have personal responsibility, you don't have to explain yourself. You have no reason to. You weren't responsible for whatever happened. Carrying on, um, or what we also see is, is the consequences of the fall into sin. Rather than accepting that responsibility that God had given him, given to him, rather than Adam saying, I ate the fruit that you told me not to, Adam says, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree and I ate. He shirked his responsibility. He blamed someone else for what had happened. It's an immediate consequence of the fall into sin. And then in verse 13, Then the Lord God said to the woman, <clears throat> What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. And we see the same thing. We see God giving Eve the ability to defend herself. The only reason he gave, that, gave her that ability is because she had personal responsibility. Without personal responsibility, there would be no need, no reason to defend herself. And then again, we see the consequence of the fall into sin. Rather than accepting her responsibility to not eat of the fruit, she blamed the serpent. And perhaps what, what most reinforces this point is verse 14. When God starts speaking to the serpent, God never gave the serpent the chance to defend itself. Instead, verse 14 says, The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. The serpent didn't have responsibility. God never gave the serpent the chance to defend itself. So we can see the separation between man and animals in the created order. Man has personal responsibility as part of creation, while the animals do not. God intended with creation, God intended that man would live in freedom and would have absolute personal responsibility. That's part of the created order. It's part of what it means to be man, to be a human. Um, I'm just going to go through my notes here and see if I miss anything, so just bear with me. <clears throat> right, so um, personal responsibility, the, the acceptance of personal responsibility is part of what it means to be human. It's part of God's created order, part of God's will for man is to have freedom and to also have personal responsibility. That's what Genesis, well, all of the creation story tells us that. God created man in his image and part of that is having free will and having personal responsibility. So God created man to be free, to have free will, to have freedom. And God also created man with personal responsibility. What does that mean for us today? Well, we can take a few things from it. If we are abdicating our personal responsibility, shirking our personal responsibilities that God has given us, then we are doing the exact same thing that Adam and Eve did immediately following the fall into sin. We are essentially decreasing our humanity decreasing what it means to be made in the image of God. Like I said, part of what it means to be made in the image of God is to accept personal or to have personal responsibility. And when we shirk our responsibilities, 
well, that's a sin. We are, we are disobeying God's will for our lives. Similarly, if someone takes someone else's personal responsibility, that's also, that, that also means that um, they are decreasing that person's humanity. So if, if, if you do something for somebody that they are responsible for, that they have the ability to do, you are in essence decreasing their humanity to carry on themes that uh, that came out in the story of liberty under a tyrannical government the the government is saying is taking away freedom say they take away liberty of conscience the government is saying you no longer have responsibility to think for yourself we will do the thinking for you we will tell you what to think we will tell you what to do what the government is doing is decreasing their humanity. Decreasing what it means to be made in the image of God. They're, they're essentially trying to suppress God's image in man by decreasing their freedom and decreasing their personal responsibility. And that happens at every level. So, um, just thinking of my own, my own situation. If I try to shirk my responsibilities to let's say my my children if i decide that you know what i do not want to i do not want to to parent them i'm going to leave that is an absolute shirking of my responsibility that is <clears throat> denying what god has called me to do it's denying um what it means to be made in the image of God. Because to be made in the image of God is to accept your responsibility. Likewise, if I, if I, if I <clears throat> accept my responsibility as a parent, but then I take away all of my children's responsibilities, if I attempt to do everything for them throughout their whole um, developmental years, and that can take many forms, then I'm also denying their humanity. I'm denying their responsibility. I'm denying that they've been made in the image of God and have their own responsibilities. Um, <clears throat> extending that to society, we see that society is, um, in many cases, attempting to deny responsibility and it makes sense because they've also denied God. They've denied that we're made in the image of God. So of course they're going to deny their responsibilities. It's really interesting to consider with regards to, to COVID. Now, I know a lot of people have different opinions about, about um, the government interventions, about the lockdowns, about mask wearing and, and everything else. I'm not going to get into it here. But part of all that's going on is the government saying, we're responsible for your health. It's, it's up to us to stop the spread of the, the virus. And what they're doing by saying that is, is they're taking away your personal responsibility to stop the virus. It'd be an entirely different thing if the government spread accurate information about the virus, said... Um, this is what's happening. This is the threat level. This is the, we, these are recommended ways to prevent the spread and to keep yourself safe. And then it was up to you to implement them in your life. That would be giving you responsibility for your health. But by, but when the government mandates lockdowns, forces people to stop working, um, closes businesses, mandates masks that's the government taking responsibility for your health and to a certain extent that's also the government denying your humanity at a certain level um ultimately the government can't be responsible for your health um ultimately health is is part of your personal responsibility 
So why don't we just leave it at that? Why, why can we not be responsible for our health? Now, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that the government has no role in COVID. I'm not saying that there are no interventions that are, are permissible. But if we're looking at it through the lens of maintaining personal responsibility for our own health, and if the government was seeking to um, apply interventions or, or apply recommendations based on maintaining personal responsibility, I think things would look entirely different right now. Just something to think about. Now, this idea of this sort of extreme idea of personal responsibility is also catching on in certain areas of society. There's, there's a number of people who have made sort of, who, who have, who have grown their reputation based off of the idea of personal responsibility. I want to bring a couple of them up. There's a guy named Jocko Willink, who, who was a U.S. Navy SEAL. He has his idea of basically extreme ownership. That's what he calls it. And what it is, is it's nothing other than accepting full responsibility in your life to the highest level that you can. And it's really interesting. I don't think he makes this connection, but to me, accepting as much responsibility in your life as possible means that you are accepting God's will for your life as much as possible, that you are attempting to live as a being made in the image of God as much as possible by accepting as much responsibility as possible. Similarly, um, Jordan Peterson is, is constantly on the personal responsibility. He's constantly talking about personal responsibility. One thing that he says that really caught my attention. Um, I, this is not a complete quote. It's just what I remember of it. But he says, never do anything for anyone that they can do themselves. That's an interesting quote. I'll say it again. Never do anything for anyone that they can do themselves. Now, I don't, I don't think he goes this far. But I would say that if you do something for someone that they can do themselves, if you do that, you are decreasing their humanity. But I can already hear the, the arguments against that. Aren't we as Christians called to, to help people? Aren't we called to show love to our neighbor, um, help the sick, help the poor, um, help the homeless, help the widow in distress, everything else? Well, it's very, we have to be very careful with taking this idea of individual responsibility of never helping someone in a way that they can help themselves. We have to be very careful to prevent this from becoming purely individualistic. So individualism would say like someone who, someone who is purely individualistic would say, I'm going to do what I want. I don't care about how it affects someone else. Um, sure, I'm going to obey the law of the land, but I'm just going to do what I want, not worry about someone else. But remember, because responsibility is so closely tied to freedom and freedom is to do the will of God, then your personal responsibility is to do the will of God. And the will of God says that you love your neighbor. Your personal responsibility is to love your neighbor. It's, it's entirely different than the rampant individualism that we see in Western culture today. Extreme ownership, as is dubbed by Jocko Willink, or, or absolute personal responsibility, means that you will also love your neighbor as yourself. It means that you will ultimately do the will of God, because that's what personal responsibility is. Um, <clears throat> I had a couple other points. One of them slipping in my mind. I'm just going to refer back to my notes. 
Um, so this, this idea of, of individualism is, is so wrong because everyone needs help somewhere. No one can do it on them. Like no one can do it by themselves. God designed us to live in community. God designed us to, to need to help each other and need help from someone else. And that is an aspect of personal responsibility. That is an aspect of, of, um, personal responsibility, freedom, obeying God's will. It's all tied together. So we can't ignore God's call to love our neighbor by saying personal responsibility. Now, implementing this <clears throat> takes a lot of wisdom. It takes a lot of discretion. If you are called to help your neighbor, but you're also called to <clears throat> not decrease their personal responsibility. Because if you just decrease their personal responsibility, you also decrease their humanity, but you're still called to love them. How do you do that? And it, this is where, I'll, this is where wisdom and discretion are needed. A someone, someone, for example, who is suffering from a, a severe anxiety disorder might need help with the most basic tasks of life. They might, they might need help, um, doing grocery shopping. They might need help cooking meals. They might need help getting out of bed if, if the anxiety is bad enough. But in that case, they, they can't help themselves. It would, for, for them to be able to do those tasks on their own, they first have to get past the anxiety of those tasks. So they might need help in those tasks for a little while until they can start to do it on their own. But you can't help them that way forever. Once they can do it on their own, they have personal responsibility to do it themselves. And you would be decreasing their humanity if you do it for them. But until they can do it themselves, then you have a responsibility to help them. Or, or a single mother. A single mother who is um, attempting to support her three children. Um, she's working two part-time jobs. Say 60 hours a week to, to put food on the table. She doesn't have time to prepare meals. She doesn't have the ability to, <clears throat> to always do all her own shopping. Perhaps she needs help to get normal daily tasks done. And then because it's God's will, because it's part of God's will to love your neighbor, it's part of our responsibility to help her do that. But then when life changes and she no longer needs that help, it's also part of our responsibility to not do those things for her because we would be decreasing her, her humanity if we did. So it takes a lot of wisdom and discretion to be able to do this, to, to maintain your personal responsibility, love your neighbor, and maintain their personal responsibility at the same time. It's very difficult to do. And this is also why the government should not be involved in charity work. Um, how can a bureaucrat working in an office a thousand miles away decide how a homeless person or a single mother or someone who has a mental health disorder, how can he decide how much help they need without taking away their personal responsibility, without taking away their humanity? He can't. He's not involved in their situation. He can't decide what they need. He can't provide the proper level of support and care without, in some way, either failing to, <clears throat> to give the proper level of support or giving too much support that he decreases their responsibility. It takes, um, it takes people at the most local level who are in relationship with the people who need help. It takes those people to actually provide charity. And 
Um, in my local situation, I know of some, some excellent movements that are attempting to do exactly that. Just local people attempting to um, build relationships with the people that need help and, and um, accepting responsibility for their situation and, and living out God's will to, to help those people. And that's also personal responsibility because God has called us to do that. So that's part of our responsibility. If we, if we didn't do those things, we would not be accepting personal, personal responsibility. But then we also have to know when to stop helping those people, when to um, give them back their responsibility in order to not decrease their humanity. Um, I think that's, that's about all that I had to say on this issue. Someone might say, but, but Mike, like people are sinful. People fail in their responsibilities all the time. Don't we need laws to, 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 to keep people responsible to enforce things? This idea is actually, like, it's bang on. Um, and it, I want to go back to the point that freedom, personal responsibility, they're both tied, like, they're both um, inherently tied to God's will. So it, these ideas, freedom is only attainable. You can only... Um, move towards freedom and move towards complete personal responsibility within a society that that is devoted to God and under a government that is committed to doing God's will. If society turns away from God or if the government denies God and doesn't follow God's law, then you're also going to move away from freedom. You're also going to move away from proper personal responsibility. They're just completely connected together that you cannot have freedom. You cannot have a proper view of personal responsibility if you are not willing to obey God's will. I think, I think that's, all, that's about all that I have to say on that point. Oh, one other, one other point. This was actually <clears throat> recognized by at least one of the founders, one of the writers of the U.S. Constitution. I'm going to absolutely butcher this quote because um, I can't, I can't remember it word for word. But one of the founders of, of, or one of the signatories of the U.S. Constitution, can't recall his name off the top of my head, but he acknowledged that the freedoms in the U.S. Constitution would only work for a moral population. Um, when, when the population turns immoral, turns away from, from ultimately God's will, then the government would necessarily have to become tyrannical, would have to decrease the freedoms, decrease the rights that the people had according to the Constitution. This was recognized because freedom, personal responsibility, and God's will, God's law, the created order, are absolutely tied together. And there is one other thing that I want to bring up that I forgot about. I have this quote here. Um, <clears throat> Dan Crenshaw is a politician in the States. I think, I think he's a state representative for Texas. Um, I'm not entirely caught up on U.S. politics. But he put out a tweet just a couple days ago and there it was a long tweet I'm only gonna read one part there's one part of that tweet where he said you can't have freedom without order order without law law without morality morality without religion or religion without God so I'm gonna read it again now that you know the ending I'm gonna read it again so you know where it's going you can't have freedom without order order without law, law without morality, morality without religion, or religion without God. 
Ultimately, if you tie the beginning and the end together, you can't have freedom without God. And I think that's what we miss when we say the government has to step in. The government has to step in to, <clears throat> to maintain order. The government has to step in to make sure that people do the right thing. What we miss is the only reason that the government has to step in and decrease personal freedom is because people have turned away from God. What does this mean for us today? Well, like I said before, Christians should be fighting for freedom. But if we want to increase freedom, if we want to increase personal responsibility, if we are interested in accepting our responsibility and fully realizing our humanity that we're made in the image of God, then we have to preach the gospel. We have to, we have to spread the gospel so that so that people are willing to be free, so that people are willing to obey God's will. Now, I, I actually think this is all I have to say on the topic. I think I'm just going to leave it there. If you have any questions, comments, complaints, criticisms, or any good feedback, that'd be great too. You can, uh, you can send them to the Facebook page. You can email me, oct at allmail.net. Um, like I said before, I'm trying to get on other other social networks as well. I would like to upload more videos to YouTube. Um, I'm actually recording video now, recording myself talking, so you can you can watch my ugly mug on YouTube um, if you're interested in doing that. Um, but share these conversations, share these ideas. You don't have to share my videos; that's fine. But talk about these ideas with other people. Um, Talk about the pursuit of freedom. Talk about how freedom is intrinsically linked to God's law. Without God's law, we don't have freedom. How freedom is absolutely linked to, to personal responsibility. If we deny personal responsibility, we deny our, our humanity. Talk about these ideas because they're important ideas. People died for these ideas. Um, the story of liberty talks a lot about that. People died for freedom. People died for the ability to accept personal responsibility. It seems foreign to us right now, but um, in a lot of ways, we're just very, we're very almost ambivalent about the freedoms that we have. And I think it's important to recognize that, that you know what, people did die for these freedoms. So, so perhaps we should hold them a little closer to our heart. That's all I have to say. The, this is the third episode in the, in the sort of freedom series, there's more to come. Um, so stay tuned for that.